general workshop. Uh, so if you can uh, make that, that would be great on Saturday and come and, and enjoy that. And then today after church is the Super Salad Luncheon put on by the, by the uh, Bethany Circle. And so if you can avail yourselves of that, that would be great. Also, the Iron Sharpens Iron for Women is, if you're able to do that, uh, they're going to have to talk to me because my wife is returning from Lincoln, Nebraska this morning. So uh, she is not here to take your name, but if you can, please just talk to me about that. Uh, she does have uh, one ticket that is available uh, for anyone who would like to go to that group. Other announcements are in the uh, bulletin. You can read those for yourself. Anything else that we need to uh, announce this morning before we begin our actual worship service? Anything else anyone has? Okay. Who said I do? <laughs> huh? You have an announcement, okay? And then Nancy raised her hands. <laughs> no choir this Wednesday night. Okay. No choir this Wednesday night. Thanks. Thanks, Deb. No choir practice. So, Nancy. Rachel Circle Thursday night. Bring your cleaning supplies. Okay. Rachel Circle Thursday night. Bring cleaning supplies. We're going to clean the sanctuary. for you. That's what we can get it all spit polished. All right. Any others? Okay, well then let us prepare ourselves on this day to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
consultants are going to sit down with them and go over, again, our strengths and our weaknesses and how, what kind of impact we'd like to have in the community. So then what's going to happen, now already this past Thursday, the Administrative Council met and they went over the same questions. They went over our strengths and weaknesses and they confirmed um, that they want to change in order to have a bigger impact on the community. So Saturday's training is going to be more of the same, and it's going to be a lot of discussion, so it's really important that everybody can come. And after Saturday's training, the consultants are going to take all the input that they received, and they're going to put together a recommendation on what our church could do to make a bigger impact in our community. So next Sunday, both worship services are going to meet together at 9 o'clock, so everybody can hear the the what has happened over the weekend and their proposal for what we could change to make us have a bigger impact here in Springville and in whatever community we live in. So we'll also be assigned a coach to work with us over the next 18 months or so, so they're going to help us achieve those goals and hold us accountable, which I think is great. Yeah, it kind of sounds like voting. If we don't vote, then we can't complain. <laughs> so I guess I'd like to see our church grow with the and have a bigger impact on people in our community. We already have some awesome new members that really contribute to our church with their time and talents, like singing and cooking and vacation Bible school. And we could use some direction on how to minister to young families and the youth, as well as the older generation. We have two great worship services already that we can invite others to. Okay, I'll come. Thanks for helping me understand, and I'm glad my input matters. I'll see you on Saturday. What time? It's going to start at 10, so kind of just a little before 10 o'clock. They're going to serve lunch, so you know those lunches are always good at church. And then we're going to, we're going to end about 3 o'clock. Oh, good. Good. Well, I'll be glad to see you there. Thanks for explaining. Yeah, have a good week. Thank you, Brenda and Judge. Uh, and as I said, I hope to see you all on Saturday uh, for our workshop. And uh, those of you that are involved in the other aspects of it, uh, uh, it will be a great weekend and a good time. Uh, and it will be good for us as a church and as a community. So thank you much, too. That was great. That was great. And I want you to know they put that all together themselves, too. John doesn't want to take any credit. <laughs> That was good. They did let me review it. <laughs> that was good. Okay, now we have the kids up front. You got a Batman? Okay. 
others do well. That's great. That's good. <laughs> others. Other jobs? Well, I tell you, it'll be a joy for me this afternoon. Excuse me, Dan. It'll be a joy for me this afternoon when my wife returns. Uh, <laughs> she's been in Lincoln, Nebraska with her daughter and, and her family for the, uh, most of the last week. So they've had a great time. So it'll be nice to have her home today later. But yeah. I think it's a joy to watch our young people this week. It was homecoming week in school and the volleyball team won, the football team won. And both sets of people did it in real, um, they, they just they displayed exemplary sportsmanship. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. That's been a good week. With, uh, the sports teams are really doing well. So, and like you said, their sportsmanship is fantastic. So, uh, it's a bunch of, a bunch of good kids, a group of good kids. So, so that's great. All right, thank you. Are there others or are there other requests that we need to lift up? Day. Yes, Lisa. Next birthday is Monday. Next birthday <laughs> is Monday. Okay. I saw the look you just got. <laughs> Do we have other birthdays? You got it by yourself, <laughs> Alright, well, so we should have a birthday. <laughs> Let's say happy birthday to me. Happy birthday. Lord Jesus, we have come together because of you on this day. We have come to celebrate you and to give thanks for you in our lives. And Lord, on this day we give thanks for friends and for family and for the young ones and for the consultation coming up when we ask your presence there and with us. And Lord, for birthdays, yes in those times of celebration in our lives. And Lord, we also lift up to you those requests that are listed. You know them, and you know each need. 
and we add to that God and Max and Carol. Lord, bless them and heal them and comfort them and give them peace. These things we ask and we claim in your name on this day. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Amen. And now let us join in that prayer that you taught us years ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God. And now let us join in our song of response, more precious than silver.
painting is kind of on or as it is. And now, let us join in that time of saying thank you, Lord, for all that you give us every day of our life. And so may I have the ushers, please, as we take a time with you. standing for the reading of the gospel.
Good morning. Good morning. This morning's scripture reading is uh, Luke chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. Then Jesus said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, What will I do, now that my master is taking the position away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So summoning, summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, How much do you, do you owe my master? He answered, A hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it fifty. Then he asked another, And how much do you owe? He replied, A hundred containers of wheat. He said to them, Take your bill, and make it eighty. And his master commended the dishonest manager, because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, my friends, excuse me, and I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much, and whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust you to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is their own? No slave can serve two masters. For a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise them. You cannot serve God alone. Thanks be God. Mm. You Thank you, Rich, for the end of God's word for the week. And we must be faithful and true and honest in all of our dealings and in all of our lives. That is what we are about as Christians, that is what Jesus taught us. And therefore, we need to be about that. And now listen to the words that have come to us from Timothy. As the Apostle Paul writes to his young mentee, uh, and let him know about how to act and what to do. And uh, uh, oh, to listen to Paul's words to Timothy. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings, and all who are in high positions, so that they excuse me, so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. This is right and is acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of trust. Therefore there is one God, there is also one mediator between God and human kind, Christ Jesus himself, human who gave himself a ransom for all. This was a testament at the right time. For this, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Paul is writing, as I said, to his mentee, Timothy, who was a young minister, a young person who was getting started and Paul had mentored him and he was writing to him now as Timothy was out preaching and working in the world. And so I give thanks because now we have those same letters that we can read and we can look at what Paul was telling Timothy and maybe apply that to our own and I think that is good. Now what Paul is talking about here is prayer. Remember what he say? I want you to pray and to give supplication for all, for kings and everyone who is in high position as well as ourselves and for others. 
And so you see, we need to be about prayer. Paul said that is one of the most important things that we can be about. In fact, if you look at it, that's the first thing that he puts on Timothy's list of leadership qualities, is to be in prayer. To be in prayer. And that's what we need to be about as Christians. That should be a top priority of our lives. To be in prayer each and every day. To think about it. My mic isn't on. Sorry. There. Is that better? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Brendan. Now, to be in prayer. That's what I was talking about. That's what Timothy, I mean, what Paul is telling Timothy. We all need to be in prayer. It should be our top priority. As I said, it was the first thing that Paul listed in his list of leadership qualities and priorities as he gave to Timothy on that day. And we should not let our prayer life diminish. And I think that happens to us a lot sometimes as, as people, and as Christians. Uh, we believe in God. We believe in Christ as our Lord and Savior. We want to do it, right? Right? Yes. We want to, but often sometimes it kind of gets put down at second, doesn't it? Instead of first, because we get so many things going in our lives. And we get particularly today with everything that goes on. We just have a, you know, we just have a menagerie of things all the time that are pulling on our, on our time. And we need to make sure that we take the time to relax, to pray, to listen for God's answer. Otherwise, we may lose it. We may lose it because it then becomes not a habit of ours and not something we do automatically because we want to or because it's there, but because we haven't done it, we end up slowly, segmentally letting it out of our lives. And that's not what we need to be about. That's not what Christ wants for us. That's not what Paul is telling Timothy here. He's telling him to be about it every day. A good example of this uh, came in my reading. Uh, when I was reading over well, it's a magazine I get called On the Legs. And it had some good points in it. One of them was, did you know that Texas is losing its slang? Its twang? <laughs> yeah, that uh, surprised me when I was reading that. And uh, it's the, uh, uh, the guy's name is Lars Heinrich. He's a linguistic professor at the University of Texas. And what he what he says is that uh, Texas is losing its twang. And he said uh, 10 years ago or so, or 15 years ago, 10 to 15 years ago, 80% of Texans had a twang, as he called it, had their own uh, you know, accent. And there were different ones, but they had their own accent. And he said, now today, it's only about 30%. And you know why? Can you guess why? Huh? Influx of people, that's one, yeah. What else? There's something else that he said was even a higher impact on that. Internet. Internet, that's right. Uh, the internet and the communications that we have today with our outside world. He said because students now oftentimes will go online and take classes. And he said a student from Texas, from a small town in Texas, taking an online class or anyone may get a professor from Illinois. <laughs> and so, and then the communication that we have on Skype and on, uh, uh, you know, just talking back and forth with each other uh, is so great today that Texans are losing their twice because they are, they're not using it. They're hearing so much more and there's so much more being pressured that they're losing it. And I found, I thought that was really interesting. Uh, my wife actually is a good example of that. <laughs> if she was here, uh, she would uh, I, she would say that because when we were first married, we've been married forty three years. Uh, four. Four. <laughs> <laughs> I get corrected. Even. <laughs> You're right. We just celebrated that. Didn't we? So they're, one, they're one year ahead of us in the same month. So. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, 44 years. But anyway, when we were first married, she was a Texas gal. Uh, of course, 
she'll always say she's a Texan. Yeah. And that's one thing, too, that Texans never relinquish their Texanity, I guess. <laughs> but anyway, but she has lost her accent, uh, you know, for the most part. It used to be real heavy, and, and I remember when we took our trip uh, on our honeymoon, we drove, I was in the Air Force at the time, and, and uh, we drove uh, from San Antonio, which is where we were married, to uh, a little town in Shasta, Washington, which is where I grew up and, and lived. Little town of 700 some. And uh, the church there, the local church, held a reception for us when we came. And it was funny because during the reception, Judy was talking, and, and then she was, you know, her slang, Texas slang, and she was talking about Purdy. And, and uh, you know, that, and I, I stood up at the point and said, okay, folks, you can understand that means pretty. And, <laughs> and that was just the slang effect, but it's pretty much gone now after. She hasn't lived there for a well, while. We lived 20 years in Seattle and four years in Colorado and three years as a Tulsa and almost 14 years here now. So, I mean, that's, you know, and it's gone. It's because she wasn't using it. She was hearing other things all the time, and that was slowly diminishing her accent. And so she came to have what they call a Midwestern accent, which basically is no accent. And that's what this linguistic professor says. So you see, in relating this to today, where are we at on that? I need to get going here. In relating this to, uh, y'all keep praying, that was the name. But okay, when we pray, we should remember the priority of prayer. And that was, the, that was my first point, which Paul is talking to Timothy about. And that's what, see, we need to be thinking about that too. Or like the Texans with their accent, we could end up losing that prayer language. And that's not what we want to do. We don't want to lose our prayer language. And you see, if we don't exercise it, if we don't use it, if we don't hear it, we don't hear ourselves praying, or we don't listen for God, we're liable to lose it over time. Make sense? Yes. Make sense? And you see, that's what Paul is talking to Timothy about here today, that he read his life to him. And Paul says that we must use as many dialects as possible. Now what he's talking about here is that we must not just pray for one thing all the time. And that's what he's saying. We must pray for kings and people in high position. We must pray for others. We must pray for ourselves. We must pray for each other and for our leaders and for the world all the time. For you see, as a body of Christians, in prayer we have tremendous power. We have tremendous power in prayer as a body of Christians. And so that is when the prayers come together and we're praying for those things, there is a power that is there. There's a power that is there. Now often we have a tendency to, uh, you know, set a shotgun, <coughs> right? Oh, Lord, you know, uh, give me this. Uh, thank you for this. Help this person out. Uh, okay, that's, uh, that's good. Uh, thanks. I'll see you later. And uh, we kind of get up and move on. And don't get me wrong. All prayer is good. <laughs> okay? All prayer is good. <clears throat> but I think what Paul here is telling Timothy and what we need to be about is to be about the intensive prayer that is done in a very... Uh, deliberate manner. And it's holding up all aspects of prayer, as he calls it. The first aspect, the first dialect, he says, is request. We must be about requesting. Requesting what we desire, what God wants. And that's one thing to remember. It should always be according to God's will. And then general prayers are another in terms of our general request and the general goodness for all of our community and our world. And then intercession, which is when we intercede for someone else who is sick or is having a problem or who is upset, and we're interceding and saying, Lord, help this person, or help this situation as we intercede for them in the world. And then thanksgiving, and that's something that we should be about, is always giving thanks and praise to God for the blessings that we receive and for the answer to the prayers that will come. God always answers prayer. You know that? Maybe no. 
maybe, maybe, maybe way a while, and maybe yes. But he will always answer prayers. That's where, uh, and I don't know, some of you may not agree with me, but the song, country song that was out a while back, Unanswered Prayer. I don't know, I just, I didn't like that one. <laughs> because to me, God always answers prayers. And so anyway, remember that. And that's what Paul's talking about. We need to be about prayer in our lives. And we are to offer our prayers in an inclusive manner. We are to offer our prayers in an inclusive manner. Which means all people, the world, the leaders, it means ourselves, it means our neighbors and our friends. It means we should be praying for all in an inclusive manner. And we need to pray in a bipartisan and a political accent. Which means, even though you may not have voted for the people we have in office, you need to pray for them. Okay? Or there's someone who you don't like. Pray for them. That's what it's about. We need to be about that, because that's what Christ has called us to do. That's what he wants us to do. And as Paul said, we need to pray for kings and all who are in high places. Now, we don't have kings in this country, but we do have a president. And we do have senators and representatives and governors and mayors and council people. And we need to be praying for them each day. We need to be praying for them each day, even if you didn't vote for them, okay? You need to be praying for them, all right? So we must pray for those who live near us and who live far away. And God says that in a prayer, it is right and acceptable. And that's what uh, Paul is telling us. That is right and acceptable. Now, all prayers are right and acceptable. But we need to be praying for Paul. For Paul. And we must remember to whom we pray. To whom we pray. For to whom we pray has been revealed through Jesus Christ. Has been revealed through Jesus Christ. For Jesus is the human Divine man, as we might do. He is the human God with flesh, you might say. And that's why he is the one who has been, who has revealed God to us through the gift. For he was God. And he was God's son. He came to be human as we are, to teach and to guide us, and then to die for us, went to the cross and died for us. And then rose again from the grave to show that he is with us always through the Holy Spirit now. As he said, I go to be with the Father, I will send you that day. And that Spirit is with us, guiding us always in our prayer lives, in our work. But we must be about praying and asking for that help for ourselves and for others. That's why Paul is telling Timothy here, pray for us. Pray for the kings and those in high places. Pray for your friends, your neighbors. Pray for your ministry. For your ministry. Because it has been revealed through Jesus Christ. And he is the one that we pray to. So you see, God has given us access to him through prayer. And thus, God has given us the responsibility of prayer. And it is a responsibility, my friends. It is a responsibility. Do you believe it? Yes. yes. Are you ready to hold up that responsibility? Yes. yes. Will you? Yes. Amen. Now let us join in our closing song. Seek ye first. Please rise if you're able.
personally in the future. Wherever we go, Jesus goes with us. He has promised never to leave us or forsake us. As we go, may his presence bring us hope, life, 